Welcome to Kesed, both those of you who are here in person and those of you who are online. Wasn't that a fantastic time of worship today? I love that song, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. Well, I think the Spirit is moving because I know my heart is pounding. <laughs> For those of you who don't know me, I am Ronnie Sasaki, one of the guest speakers here at Kesed. And every so often we let Pastor Danny have a much-needed break. And it's really cool because then I get to come in sometimes and share with you what God has placed on my heart. I've been thinking a lot about heaven lately. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it's because next month I have a birthday and I'm definitely getting much older. Maybe it's because this weekend we celebrate Memorial Day and we, we take time out of our busy schedules to pause and to honor those men and women who have given their lives in service defending our country. Or it could possibly be that we've been in this pandemic for the past year and a half and I know that it has touched many lives. Many people have lost loved ones during this time. But more than anything, I've sensed this rumor, I guess, movement, if you will. Is this the second coming of Jesus? Are we getting close? It sure seems like there is evidence that perhaps things are starting to line up as the way we can imagine they would be when Jesus comes back. Now, I'm not even going to begin to try and guess when that time will be, but it sure does seem like events could possibly be leading up to it. Whatever the reason, I thought this would be a really good Sunday to just ponder this question. What will heaven be like? Now, I hope you don't think that um, I'm the expert on this subject and that you're going to walk out of here today with all of the answers. I think more than anything, you're going to walk out of here today with a whole lot more questions. And that's actually my prayer and hope for you is that you will begin to ponder this question for yourself and that you'll start to do your own research, reading through the Bible, looking for the, the hints and the clues that it gives us about what heaven will be like, perhaps reading books by those authorities or experts who you trust and really begin to learn about heaven and ponder what it will be like. After all, I became a Christian because I wanted to go to heaven and not hell. I was seven years old, and it was a hot August night, the last Sunday of a week-long old-fashioned camp meeting right over here in Orchards, Clark County Holiness Camp. Now, I used to attend this camp meeting every summer with my grandma and Grandpa Webb. And during the day, it was really fun because they had a children's program with puppets and crafts and, you know, remember the flannel graph stories and all those kinds of things that entertain kids. But in the evening, I was forced to sit through a very long, very boring service where we listened to an evangelist. And I will admit to, the, to you that after the singing was over, I would tune out. And my grandma was always prepared for this, and she brought a color book and some crayons and some drawing paper and gums and lifesavers and those kinds of things that were necessary to entertain a small child till we got to the end of this service. And I could go outside and run around in the grass and have fun like kids will do. But on this last Sunday night, for some reason, I began to listen to what the evangelist was saying. And I heard him say, if you believe in Jesus, you will go to heaven. But if you don't believe in Jesus, you'll go to hell. Well, I didn't want to go to hell. That sounded like a terrible place, and I was kind of afraid of going to hell. I definitely wanted to go to heaven. And then he asked this question, one that I'm sure if you've ever listened to an evangelist, you've heard this question before. If you were to die tonight... Where would you spend eternity, in heaven or in hell? And after he asked this question, he, he invited anybody who wanted to accept Jesus into their heart to come up to the altar. Now, this was old-fashioned. Remember what I told you? And we were in what we called a tabernacle. And in the front, they had these old wooden benches that served in, as an altar where people actually got out of their seats, came forward. I mean, how embarrassing is that? in front of everybody, came up to the front, knelt down at these wooden benches, and began to pray. And for some reason, something drew me out of my seat and up to the front to kneel at that bench. And I asked Jesus 
into my heart that night. And it was a good thing, too, because I was pretty convinced that I was going to die that night. We had a lightning storm like none that we hardly ever see around here. It was hot and it was humid and the lightning began to crackle throughout the sky. It, it was as if it was right over our heads and I thought for sure I was going to get struck by lightning and killed just like that pastor said. But thank goodness I had invited Jesus into my heart because I knew with 100% certainty that if I were to die that I would go to heaven. Nowadays I think back to that night and I figure those angels were just lighting off fireworks and celebrating my decision to become a Christian. But back then I was scared. But it never went away, this feeling of assurance, of knowing that God was in my heart, that if I died, I would go to heaven. But other than that, honestly, I seldom ever think of heaven. Unless I'm at a funeral. Then I think about heaven because... Let's face it, when somebody that we love has just died and we believe that they are going to heaven, it gives us great comfort to know that they are in a better place, that they are, have no more tears and no more sorrows and that they're in the arms of Jesus. And I like in those moments to imagine what their welcome is like as they go running through the pearly gates and into Jesus' arms. And he holds them and he hugs them. And then when they're done hugging Jesus, they go on to the next person who's gone before them. And they hug them. And then on to the next person. And on down the row of all those loved ones who have already gone. There's a choir singing. There's a band playing. And it is just a time of celebration. That's really about the only time I ever think about heaven and imagine what it will be like. And it's funny because, you know, heaven is really one of the foundational pieces of being a Christian. It's the promise of what is to come. It's the promise of something better than what we have here on earth. So why is it that we don't think about it very often? Maybe another good question to ponder on this Sunday of pondering. Well, I think one of the reasons is because we have to die to get there. At least unless Jesus comes first, there's a 100% chance we're all going to die. Now, I don't want to die. Is that okay to admit to you that I don't want to die? I love life. And oftentimes when I'm out speaking or teaching or preaching, I like to talk about living life to the fullest. Yes, God has promised us heaven, but he's also promised us this abundant life on earth. And I want to be able to live it to the fullest. Well, perhaps another reason why we don't think about heaven more often is because we do get caught up in living this life. Well, you know, the Bible promises, or it, it tells us not just to think about heaven, but to prepare for it. Colossians 3, 1 through 2 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. And then Matthew 6, 19 through 21. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I spend most of my time building treasure here on earth. How about you? I am consumed with my business and seeing that it is successful. I spend a lot of time nurturing the relationships in my life, from my family to my friends. I spend a lot of my time working on health and what it means to keep this body working for as long as it possibly can. I spend a lot of time thinking about money and will I have enough for retirement. Most of my time is spent laying up treasures here on earth rather than preparing for heaven. Now, I've done a lot of coaching of others and actually been coached myself on setting goals 
and achieving goals. And there's a couple of tools that we use that greatly increase our odds of achieving a goal that we've set. Because let's face it, have you ever set a goal and then fallen short or given up on it after a while? Well, these two tools have really helped. And one of them is to create a vivid picture in our minds of what completion of the goal looks like. What is it that we want? What is it that we are working to create in setting this goal? We create a very vivid and clear and detailed picture of what that looks like. And then the second tool that we use to achieve our goals is to run towards that picture that we've created. Always be moving in the direction of what it is we want, as opposed to looking back at what we don't want and focusing on what it is we're trying to leave behind. But now when I put this into the perspective of heaven, and getting into heaven, I think it's so hard to picture heaven because I've never been there. I don't trust all those movies in Hollywood that they've created on what heaven looks like. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. So I thought to myself, is it even possible to create a picture of heaven, to imagine what it is like in our human minds when the Bible says there's no way we can even imagine. So I thought, well, perhaps I should encourage people to do this, but then I realized that God has given us so many clues. And even though we know that what we imagine is not even going to come close to what he actually has for us, the very thought of focusing on what is possible, imagining what it is like, gives this incredible sense of comfort, this incredible sense of hope. And there are clues throughout this planet on earth, and there are clues throughout Scripture so that we can begin to paint a picture in our minds of what possibly heaven could be like. This is what I do know. God, in his love for us, always pours out the best of all that he has to give. Listen to this quote by Charles Spurgeon. He says, His favors, God's favors, are always performed with the love of his heart. He does not send us the cold meat and the broken pieces from the table of his luxury, but he dips our morsel in his dish, his own dish, and he seasons our provisions with the spices of his fragrant affections. I think one of the other reasons why it's so hard for us to focus on what heaven will be like is because we live on a planet, this earth, that is currently cursed by sin. And because of this, it's very difficult for us to ever imagine what a place could be like that doesn't have any sin. But you know, this earth was not always like that. It wasn't created that way. Seven times in the Bible, after God created different phases of heaven and earth, he said, it is good. One of those times, he specifically mentions the light was good. Two of those times, he adds in the word very, and it was very good. God created this incredible earth, this incredible planet for his children, for mankind. And then he took Adam and Eve and he placed them into this beautiful garden called the Garden of Eden, a place of unma unimaginable beauty where they were able to commune completely with the plants and the animals and with God, this incredible place that probably surpassed even the rest of the planet in its beauty. But then in chapter 3 of Genesis, sin enters into the world. Most of you know the story, but I'll just kind of briefly catch you up in case you missed it or haven't heard it in a long time. As Adam and Eve are walking through the garden, Eve is tempted by the serpent. He says to her to eat of the fruit of the tree that God had told them not to eat from. God said, you can eat 
everything in the garden, but not the fruit from this tree. And the serpent tempted Eve and offered her the fruit and told her that it would be okay. So Eve took it, ate it, and then Adam took the fruit, and he ate it, and they sinned against God. They did what God had told them not to do. So we read in chapter 3 about God's curse to Adam upon this earth. Genesis 3, 17 through 19. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the fields. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now I got firsthand experience with this curse on this planet last Saturday. My husband and I decided that we wanted to climb to the top of our property. Now we've lived out on Washougal River Road for almost 28 years. Now, if you've ever been up the Washougal River Road, it's, it's kind of a canyon, if you will, or a valley, flat down by the river, but then immediately slopes up these really steep hillsides that then level out at the top of the hill. I have never climbed to the top of our property before. But if you were here in January where I shared with you that last September when the fires were sweeping through the area, we actually had a fire sweep through our property. And it ended up being a good thing because it burned all of the underbrush. And for the first time, we could see that I might be able to make it to the top of the property. Now, the other thing about fires, though, is they say that the, the sooty dirt surface creates really good growing conditions for plants. And that soon after a fire, you'll begin to see plants begin to thrive and begin to thrive flourish. And I thought to myself, well, that's going to be really cool because all of a sudden the hillside is going to be covered with beautiful flowers and beautiful growth. Do you know what is grown faster than anything else? Thistles and thorns. And it's a good thing that we chose to climb that hillside last week because I think if we'd have waited another week or another couple of weeks, I'm not sure I would have even been able to make it up the hillside because those thorns and thistles were this tall and we began to have to plow through them. It's amazing how those things grow. I'm sure you've experienced this before if you've ever planted a garden. You plant all your seeds and you'll notice that they may peek out of the dirt this much, but all of a sudden you've got weeds that are this tall that just seem to be thriving. Well, that's the way these thorns and thistles were. But there was another thing that we noticed growing on the hillside. Look at these beautiful wild orchids. In the midst of the thorns and the thistles were these little splashes of beauty, struggling to push up through that which threatened to overtake them, wrap itself around them, and snuff them out. But they continued to grow up in spite of it, little glimmers of beauty. I know that some of you in this room feel like that oftentimes in this cursed earth that we live on. Like you're working so hard to grow, to shine, for the beauty to come through, and you just feel like those thorns and those thistles, they just keep threatening to pull you back down and, and take over. We live on a planet that is cursed by sin. And it's so difficult for us to imagine what living out from under that sin could possibly be like. I mean, just take this planet, not just a hillside that is not covered in thorns and thistles, but look at the intricacies of the ecosystems throughout this entire world. You've got the mountains and you've got the valleys and you've got the oceans and the beaches and the beautiful rock formations and the waterfalls and the glassy lakes where you can see the bottom. All the incredible beauty. If you were to picture in your mind right now the most beautiful place on this earth that you have ever been and then think that even that is under the curse of sin, what would it look like if there was no sin present 
in this world. Can you even imagine? And that's just talking about the planet itself. What about our relationships in our communities? What would it be like to have these relationships where there was no hatred, no insecurity, total trust, no backstabbing, no prejudice, no hatred, complete love, complete understanding, complete fitting in, complete acceptance, total communication with each other. Imagine what that could possibly be like, living in a place without sin. All of the beauty and the creativity and the love that continues to shine through this planet that has been riddled with sin is only one example of what God is capable of when he seasons our provisions with the spices of his fragrant affections. When we look at the story of Jesus hanging on the cross between the two thieves, and we begin to study the interaction that Jesus had between the two thieves, we get more clues as to what heaven could possibly be like. Now, if you remember the conversation, the first thief says to Jesus in a mocking way, if you are God, then why don't you save yourself? And while you're at it, why don't you save us too? And then the second thief admonishes the first thief and says, do you not even fear God? We deserve to be here. We're thieves. But this man, Jesus, he is completely innocent. He has done nothing wrong. Luke 23, 42 through 43. And the thief said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And then Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So I've got four clues about heaven for you from this very brief encounter with Jesus and those two thieves. The first is, who will be in heaven? There's no way I can possibly have a conversation with you about heaven without first addressing this issue of who will be there. Now, in 2017, Harris did a poll, the Harris poll, and asked people about if they believed in some type of afterlife. 84% of the population that they surveyed said that they believe in some sort of afterlife where the soul will go or whatever the case may be. They believed in it. 76% of those people believe that they are going to heaven after they die. And 2% of those people believed that they were going to hell after they died. Clearly, the majority of the people believe that they are going to heaven. And this is pretty common because a lot of people just simply believe by being an American you're going to go to heaven. People think, well, just because um, I didn't, I didn't um, honk my horn at that guy who cut me off on the freeway today, that's good enough to get me into heaven. Revelation 12, 27 says of those who will be in heaven, but nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Talking about who is going to be in heaven is not a very popular thing to do right now in our today's society. Because any time we make it sound like we're excluding somebody that can't get in, we're accused of being prejudiced, exclusionary, at the very least not politically correct. And let's face it, we become a society where everybody gets a trophy. 100% inclusivity means that everybody should get to go to heaven, right? Well, yes, everybody should get to go to heaven, but the Bible is very clear on who is going to be there and who is not. Now, I will tell you that Christians are oftentimes accused of being very judgmental. Some of us who've been a Christian for a very long time, like myself, every once in a while I catch myself thinking, well, I'm going to heaven, <laughs> but you're not. 
And it shouldn't be that way, right? Because as Christians, we want everybody to have a chance to be there. And truthfully, everybody does. God's gift of grace and salvation is available to every single person on this planet. Sometimes we forget, at least I forget, that we are all equal in this. We're all born under the curse of sin. If it weren't for God's gift of salvation and grace, every single one of us in this room and out there on the planet, would be destined for hell. But because of Jesus' gift, we have a chance to go to heaven. Heaven is exclusionary only to those who choose not to receive his gift that is available to everyone. Romans 10, 9 through 13 tells us how. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That one thief called on the name of the Lord as he hung there on the cross. Jesus saw his heart. He didn't have eloquent words and perfect theology. He said, I'm a sinner. I deserve to be here. He admitted that Jesus is God. He is innocent. He has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me today in heaven. And so he got to go to heaven. So the second thing we learn about heaven is that today you will be with me in heaven, Jesus said. That word today, there's no waiting period. No long slumber, no holding pattern that were put into. The thief was welcomed into heaven, into the arms of Jesus immediately upon his death. The third clue that we have about heaven is when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, his use of the word paradise here means the Garden of Eden. Now, after Adam and Eve had sinned, they were banished from the Garden of Eden, and there were guards that were put there to protect it from them being able to reenter. Now, I don't know that if this this is just a figure of speech, that heaven is very much like the Garden of Eden, that all of the splendor and all of the beauty and all of the perfect communion that went on in the Garden of Eden is what's in heaven. Or perhaps, possibly, the Garden of Heaven is... The Garden of Eden is now the Garden of Heaven, is now in heaven. It's where we go when we die. I really don't know. But in any case, I think it's pretty clear that it's a spectacular place to be, an incredible place to be that is so much like God's original creation that he intended for us to be in from the very beginning. It takes us back to that beautiful, perfect, very good place. Fourthly, fourth clue, Jesus said, you will be with me. Heaven is the place where we will dwell with God. See, more than all of the beauty and all of the perfection and all of the riches that we start to imagine are in heaven, the very word heaven signifies that it's the place where God dwells. John 14, 2 through 3. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. 
In the days of Jesus, it was very customary as they were traveling together as a group and they began to near a town that somebody would go ahead into the town and they would begin to prepare lodging for their group so that they could all be together and then they would prepare food so that they could all dine together as a group. Sometimes they would even prepare entertainment so that they all could be together once they got into the town and everything was arranged ahead of time. So Jesus, as he's talking about going ahead of the disciples to this place called heaven, he's using um, illustrations that they can relate to, that they could understand. They could understand this going before to prepare this place. Now, this translation also uses the word mansions. I think it's kind of cool to imagine living in a mansion. I don't know about you, but when I think of a mansion, I think of this house right here. Can you see the house through the trees? This is Bill Gates' house. I took this picture from the water. I was in a boat. Every time you see a little building poking out through the foliage, which is completely just about hidden the place, it's all one huge, massive, connected mansion. Most of us think of Bill Gates as one of the richest men in the world, so we can imagine that this is a good example of a mansion. Now, we might have a house like this in heaven. We might not. Truthfully, I don't know. <laughs> I've already said that I think anything that we can imagine is not even close to what God has for us. So maybe it will include a mansion, and maybe it'll include something better, something different. Who knows? Another mystery to go home and ponder today. But when he talks about mansions, and other translations say, my house has many rooms. There are many rooms. There is no housing shortage available in heaven. And it also means the word abode, this place where we will dwell with God. There is no housing shortage, whether it's a room, whether it's a mansion. All who come will be, have a place to be where they can dwell with God. Our longing for heaven is a longing for God. Psalm 30, 60, excuse me, Psalm 63, 1 talks about this longing that we have. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Sounds kind of like the earth that is under the curse, doesn't it? Being with God is the heart and soul of heaven. Every other heavenly pleasure will derive from and be secondary to his presence. God's greatest gift to us always is and always will be himself. I'll tell you something, as wonderful as all this seems, this place called heaven where we go when we die, is not all there is. The Bible is filled with hints and prophecies of more to come after the second coming of Jesus Christ. We talk about it at the beginning. Are things lining up for him to come back? I don't know, and I'm not even going to try and guess. But if we believe the Bible, we have to believe the second coming is near and it will surpass everything so far. 2 Peter 3.13 But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. It's as if we've come full circle. We talk about Genesis. In the first two chapters of the Bible, God created the heavens and the earth, the beginning of time. And in the last two chapters of Revelation, the very last two chapters of the Bible, God talks about the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, the beginning of eternity. Can you begin to picture how incredible it will be 
Well, just in case you need more food for your imaginations to begin to build upon, I wanted to read from you, for you some verses from Revelation. Most of the verses that we quote about heaven are referring to the new heaven and the new earth. And who knows how much it's going to be alike or better. Again, it's always going to be incredible because we know that that's what God has planned for us. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, no crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. There's more. I mean, there's lots more. <laughs> For today, you just get five more verses from Revelation 22, 1 through 5. He goes on to say, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord of God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Don't you think it's ironic? Perhaps not. That at the beginning of creation, God specifically talks about the light being good. And in Revelation, when he's referring to the new heaven and the new earth, he calls out the light and says it will no longer be even necessary because God is the light. Full circle. Randy Alcorn said in his book, Heaven, what God made us to desire, and therefore what we do desire, if we admit it, is exactly what he promises to those who follow Jesus Christ. A resurrected life in a resurrected body with the resurrected Christ on a resurrected earth. Can you imagine what heaven is like? What is it that you're looking forward to most? Maybe you've got a loved one, family member, child, parent, somebody who's gone before you. And you cannot wait to run into their arms and see them again because you miss them. Maybe you've been battling some kind of physical ailment for so long and you're just so weary of it. You're looking forward to getting that resurrected body and, and having that healing where you no longer have to deal with the pain. Can you imagine a place where there is no illness, no heart disease, no cancer, no viruses? No blindness, no deafness, no lameness. See, when I get to heaven, I'm going to admit to you that I want to get a new leg. I was born missing half of my right leg. And I'll tell you that I've been really blessed. I see my leg as a gift from God. And this artificial leg that I wear is brand new. I just got it a few months ago, and it's really great. And I am so grateful for it. But man, I cannot wait to get to heaven. I've always imagined God handing me the silver platter with a leg on it. Right? Made out of bones and tissue and blood vessels and you can and feel it. I, I don't know if we're even going to have bones and vessels and skin and all that stuff in heaven. I kind of think we might. And I'm looking forward to that day where I get this real leg. But more than anything else, 
More than that, I'm looking for holding Jesus' hand and walking on that perfect leg without my usual stagger. Walking hand in hand with my Lord and Savior who has created this beautiful place that he's prepared for us to spend our eternity. I want to look in his face and feel that complete connection that is not hindered by any curse from sin, but is this beautiful connection with our Lord and Savior and to know that this is forever. Can you begin to imagine it? just a little bit? Can you begin to picture it and visualize what heaven can be like? Can you even imagine? Let's pray.